for the next eight years, we were living in an abusive home. We were at the mercy of this man and his mood, and we had to be alert 24-7. He would say he was going to drive us all off a bridge. He would say he was going to kill us all. It could happen at any time, on any day. Even on Christmas Day one year, we had a police call out. By 15, I had developed an eating disorder. I started skipping class all the time. I would stay in bed with my curtains drawn. I was at rock bottom. And I think the thing about rock bottom is that some people really have to reach that place before they'll call out to God. Hello everyone, welcome to 828 with Kate. My name is Kate Taylor, this is our very first episode and it has been a long time coming. I initially had the idea for 828 with Kate around two years ago, but it turns out that self-producing a podcast when you know absolutely nothing about podcasting is a lot harder than it seems. I feel like most people must have a team because I have had to learn how to edit audio, video, all things that were way over my head. And I'm also a chronic perfectionist. I hate not being good at something. So this podcast is really me pushing back against my perfectionism because I know I'm not going to be good at this to start with. I figured a good place to start for episode one would be my testimony which has been highly requested on TikTok for the past couple of years. I just couldn't do it justice on that platform, and I've also had to really psych myself up to tell this story because it's intense and it's vulnerable. I've put on my comfiest sweatsuit today because I thought if I have to get into these memories, I'm at least going to be as comfy as possible while I do it. I will be talking about physical abuse, suicide, and mental health challenges. If these subjects could be triggering for you, please listen at your own discretion. The reason I'm choosing to get into these topics is because when I was going through these things, I felt incredibly alone. Even now, I often feel alone in the aftermath of everything I went through, and I'm sure there's someone out there in the same boat I'm praying that this reaches you and you know that I'm right there with you. And for the rest of you listening, whether or not your trials have looked the same as mine or yours have been different, this podcast is inspired by my belief that every single person has a unique 828 story that God is wanting to write in your life. Romans 828 is my life verse. It basically says that if you will choose to embrace God's love and seek his purpose, he will intricately weave every aspect of your life together for good, even the parts that you do not like. And in this episode, I'm going to tell you how he's done that in my life. So let's begin all the way back at the beginning. I was born in Northern England in 1996 to a single mother. We lived in a small house in a small village and my mum really struggled financially but she did a really good job raising me by herself with very little. My parents had split up before I was born and my dad ultimately made a decision to not be a part of my life. Now before I delve any deeper I do want to approach this topic with sensitivity. We all know that breakups are difficult and I obviously have a limited perspective because I was not there when my parents split up. Over the past 27 years, I have heard various accounts of what happened between my parents and why. I've accepted I will never truly know and it also feels kind of irrelevant to me now. What I do know is that I love both of my parents. They have both made mistakes, just as I make mistakes, because we're human. I don't assign blame or pass judgment. I am only sharing my journey to hopefully help someone else. With that being said, what my childhood looked like as a result of their separation is that I did not meet my dad and I grew up without him. 
at primary school, I remember my friends being confused by that. And they would ask me, but when was the last time you saw your dad? And I would have to clarify that I had never seen him. I had never even met him before. To be honest, I was as confused as they were about that. I knew my dad's name. I had seen a photo of him. And I knew some basic facts that my mom had told me, like what he did for work. But I never fully understood why he was gone. I was told that he didn't want a kid, and that's why he had left. But that stopped making sense to me when I learned that he had started a new family. He had got married and had a son a couple years after me, and he had taken on two stepdaughters. That was very confusing to me. I couldn't understand why he would want to raise those children, but he didn't want to raise me. And as a kid, you can't grasp complex adult problems like breakups, and so you internalize them. And I came to the conclusion that there must be something wrong with me. I knew I was an unplanned baby, and I was even told that some family members had suggested I either be aborted or put up for adoption. So although I knew that my mum wanted me, I still felt extremely unwanted by my dad and his family. And the negative belief that became instilled in me was that I was a mistake. That belief then shaped my identity for years to come. Now, as far as religion goes, my upbringing was not religious. I was not raised reciting scripture or going to church every weekend like I know a lot of you were and I envy that. I had obviously heard about Jesus, but I didn't have understanding about Jesus. It just wasn't part of my life. However, even as a kid, I did have this natural curiosity about God. I had this innate sense that he was real. Especially when I would look up at the sky at night, I remember thinking, God must be real. But I did not have a relationship with him so I really did not have an anchor in my life for everything that was about to unfold. Because life took a sharp turn when I was five. Up until this point, I was a silly, funny kid. I loved to dress up, especially as a clown or in a wedding dress. If you're watching on YouTube or Spotify, I'm going to put my favorite photo of me as a child. I think it captures my essence of just being goofy and loving to make people laugh, and she is my favorite version of me. However, I would say this photo also kind of marks the end of my childhood and of my innocence. Around this time, my mum met a guy on a blind date, and they ended up getting married that same year, which I believe was the first red flag. Because dangerous people will often rush the relationship. They will rush you to get married. They will rush you to move in with them because they want control over you. And they also can't keep the mask they're wearing for too long before their real self slips out. So while he was still charming, they got married and we moved in with him. I'd say two good things came from that marriage. One, they had my little brother a year later, and two, we had a bit more money. We moved to his big farmhouse. It had tons of land. I was obsessed with fairies at this point, so I was always outside building fairy houses, and he had two dogs that became my best friends, and I thought I now had a dad. But For the next eight years, we were living in an abusive home. I don't recall the first time I saw my mom being hit. And honestly, a lot of my memory from age 5 through 13 is a blackout from the trauma. But I do remember specific moments. I remember when I was seven, seeing my mom 
sitting on the couch in her room holding her face and taking her wet cloths to put on her black eye. I remember wanting to protect my mum but feeling like I couldn't. Whenever there was a fight, I would usually hide just outside of the room where my stepdad couldn't see me, but I could be close enough to listen to see if it was bad enough that I needed to call the police. I would be just outside the room with the number dialed and ready, but I also knew that if I called the police, he would be more mad. So I would only ever call the police on the occasions when I thought that he was actually going to kill her. And the times I did call, I always thought, if he catches me, he's going to snatch the phone, and he might kill us before they get here, or before I have a chance to say where we are. And my stepdad was very, very cunning. I had watched him open the door to the police with a smile and shake their hand with the same hand that he had just punched my mom with. He would even drive my mom to the hospital and lie to doctors and nurses about why she was all beat up and come up with some elaborate excuse for what had happened. To the outside world, he was this lovely guy, but with a flick of a switch, he would change personalities and behind closed doors, he was insane. One of the worst things for me was being in a car with him. I still struggle with being a passenger in anyone's car because of this. Um, Any time that there was an argument in the car, my stepdad would lock all of the doors. He would put his foot fully to the floor and start swerving the car onto the opposite side of the road. He would say he was going to drive us all off a bridge. He would say he was going to kill us all. And I remember being sat in the back seat next to my brother, who was still in a baby chair. And I would just close my eyes and think, please stop, please stop, please stop. Um, most of the times he did. But I believe there was one occasion when he purposely crashed the car with us in it. It was moments like this that I realized we had no control. We were at the mercy of this man and his mood, and we had to be alert 24-7 in anticipation of his next blow-up. It could happen at any time, on any day. Even on Christmas Day one year, we had a police call out. There was always something crazy happening, so you could never relax, there was never a sense of calm. Only now, as an adult, am I starting to realize what calm actually feels like, and it's hard for my nervous system to lean into that feeling of calm, because it never felt that. Life was unstable and volatile, and that was the norm. To add to all of this, we also moved house frequently. At one point, I think we worked out my brother had moved 14 times in 14 years, so once for every year of his life. But the biggest move came when I was 11 and he was around 5. I'd just started secondary school in England. I'd only been there 5 weeks when my stepdad landed a new job in New Zealand. We had already been there on holiday to see what it was like, so I think I was excited to move to New Zealand, but I'd say that's because it felt like another holiday. I don't think I could fully grasp the concept of us not coming back. On my last day of school in England, I didn't even hug my best friend goodbye, despite it being the last time I would see him for over a decade, because it just didn't feel permanent. But we did leave England. We left everything and everyone we had ever known. We boarded a 25-hour flight and traveled to the furthest country you can possibly go to. 
if you live in England, there is no country that is further away than New Zealand. I think my mum thought that if we moved, it could be a fresh start and maybe things would get better with my stepdad. Maybe if he had a new job and a new environment, he would be more relaxed and I'm sure he made those promises to her. But you know how they say wherever you go, your problems follow you. Well, they sure did. Except now we were isolated. Which is another red flag when it comes to abusive people. They will try to get you in a situation exactly like we were in. We had no family support. We were all connected to my stepdad's work visa. All the money was tied to him and his business. Which means if we left, we would have no money, no visa, and nowhere to go. We were stuck here. We moved into this house which was so beautiful. People used to call it the doll's house because it looked so perfect from the outside. But even looking at this photo turns my stomach because of everything that happened here. I also had to start my new school in New Zealand and I guess being the new kid made me an easy target because I was really badly bullied in my first year by a big group of boys. They made fun of me for how I looked. I was super pale compared to all the other kids who grew up going to the beach and I couldn't even swim. They made fun of me for how I spoke, so I tried really hard to get rid of my British accent because I just didn't want to be different from all the other kids. So I tried really hard to speak like a Kiwi, which is probably partly why my accent is a bit of a mix these days, because I tried so hard to change it back then. That first year in New Zealand, my self-esteem really started to deteriorate. Deteriorate? That doesn't sound right coming out of my mouth. Um, I felt alone in this new country, no one at school knew what was happening at home. Maybe if they did, they would have gone easier on me. I did eventually start making some good friends, but in the beginning, school was hard and home was even harder, so I really had no reprieve. But it was during this time that I actually came across something that gave me a shred of hope. I had started randomly finding worship songs online. And I say randomly because now I know that there's no such thing as coincidence. One of my friends recently told me that coincidences are just moments that God chooses to be anonymous. There was definitely nothing like this being played in my home. I wouldn't have even known it was called worship music back then. But I downloaded them, I put them on my iPod shuffle, Remember those tiny little iPods? It was like this big. It didn't have a screen. You just had to listen to the first few seconds of each song to find the one you wanted. It would be like Jesse McCartney, Hilary Duff worship song. And I would listen to them every day walking home from school. I remember there was this one specific song that I listened to over and over again. It was called You Are Not Alone by Meredith Andrews. And the lyric said, You are not alone, for I am here. Let me wipe away your every fear. My love, I have never left your side. I have seen you through the darkest night, and I am the one who's loved you all your life. It spoke to everything I was going through as an 11-year-old. And I think finding these worship songs got me thinking again about God's existence and gave me hope that maybe someone was looking out for me. Maybe someone did see everything I was going through. I would listen to this Meredith album on repeat and the whole way home, I would just be praying that my mom would still be alive when I got back. At this house, there were steps that led up to the front door and every day I would make my little brother wait at the bottom of the steps while I went up to the house to check if it was safe and he didn't know that that's what I was doing, but every day I was sure that when I opened the front door, my mom would be dead, um, and I didn't want him to see it.
praise God that he heard my prayers and that never happened. But it came extremely close. In October 2009, I was 13 years old and they had the worst fight they had ever had. I remember thinking it seemed worse than normal. And so I snuck the phone from the house and we had a large garage that was separate from the house, kind of opposite. I went into the garage and I remember looking for something that I could use to protect myself or defend my mum. I remember looking through all of the tools and thinking, could I hit him with a hammer? What could I use? Um, I ended up finding a Stanley knife, which I hit up my sleeve, and I took my brother outside to play on our trampoline, where we were far enough away from the fight, but I could still hear what was happening. And I think I called my friend. There was one friend at school who I never explicitly told about the abuse, but she would occasionally come have sleepovers at our house, and after we went to bed, she would hear yelling downstairs and things being thrown, and I would tell her it was nothing, but she knew, and it was kind of an unspoken understanding between us. Sometimes I would call her when I was hiding with my brother during a fight, and we would just sit in silence on the phone while I was monitoring what was going on. Sometimes I would even hide the phone, but I would tell her to stay on the line in case something happened. I think that's what I did on this day, but it's really a blur. I know at some point the fight moved outside. My mum was probably trying to leave, but she ended up being pinned up against the garage and my stepdad was swinging a crowbar at her. The police eventually came. I don't remember if I called them or if it was my friend, but I do know that when they arrived, I took the Stanley knife that I had hidden up my sleeve and I hid it underneath the outside of my trampoline because I thought that if the police saw me with it, that I would be in trouble. By the time they'd arrived, my mom was covered in blood. Her shirt had been completely ripped off of her body and it was a white t-shirt that looked red. It was so bloody. I remember the police holding it up and pleading with my mum to press charges. They said they had enough evidence that they could have him deported from the country. But she just couldn't do it. And if you've never been in an abusive relationship, this will be impossible for you to understand. But there is a reason that it takes on average seven attempts for a survivor to leave their abuser for good. My stepdad would threaten to commit suicide if we left. One time he actually did try to kill himself in the garage, and for some reason while he was doing it he called from the garage to the home phone, and I answered the home phone and just heard weird choking noises on the other end of the phone and my mum found him. Um, another time when mum tried to leave, he threw himself spread eagle on the front of the car and was trying to smash the windscreen. I remember mum driving around and around the driveway trying to throw him off of the car. And this is horrible to admit, but I hoped that he would fall off and that she would run over him. That's how terrified I was and how much I believed that if that didn't happen, he was going to kill us all. Statistically, leaving is the most dangerous time for a survivor. 75% of domestic violence-related homicides occur upon separation, and there is a 75% increase of violence upon separation for at least two years. I did not know these statistics back then, but I didn't need to. I certainly felt the danger and the risk of leaving. However, after this last major fight that they had, I think it was the next day that I went to my mum. She was upstairs sitting on her bed 
my stepdad was at work and I said to her, I think we need to go now. And she looked at me and I think we both knew at this point that if we didn't leave now, we might not get a chance to leave. So we decided this was it. We were going to try and escape while my stepdad was at work. My mum passed me and my brother bin bags. She said, you can take whatever you can fit in here. But we didn't have time to be selective or pick out our favourite things. I remember just quickly stuffing things in the bag as fast as I could. And my heart was beating so fast. I remember being more afraid on that day than any other because I thought if he comes home while we're leaving, it's not going to end well. But thankfully, we were able to get out. One of my mum's friends was actually on holiday and she had left my mum a key to her house. So we were able to go and stay there for about a month, I think, while my mum found a new job and eventually found a house that we could rent. And it was such a blessing that they opened their home to us during that time because we wouldn't have had anywhere else to go. And I had dreamt about this day that we would finally escape. I always thought when we leave, when we finally leave, everything will get better and life can be normal. What I definitely did not expect is that in many ways things would get worse. Although my stepdad was no longer physically living with us, he was still living up here in my mind and I started obsessively checking the locks on windows, checking the locks on doors. I was sure that he was going to show up, and he actually did. So that only reinforced my fear. One day he came to the new house and he picked up plant pots that were outside the front door and started smashing them against the side of the house. Another time he came while I was home alone. And he was walking around the outside of the house trying to break in. I hid from him, but he saw me through the window. And then he called the police on me because I wouldn't answer the door to him at the house that wasn't even his house. And he shouldn't have been there, which I think speaks to his mental state. By the time the police arrived, I think he had gone And then they issued us with a protection order against him for 12 months. But even after that, I was having flashbacks and nightmares constantly. To this day, I still check under the bed before I go to sleep and I sleep with a nightlight. And I'm 27 years old. Until I went to therapy, that was something I felt really embarrassed by. Now I know I have CPTSD, which is Complex Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. However, back then, all I knew was that it felt impossible to get out of bed. By 15, I had developed an eating disorder, which I had had signs of from as early as seven years old. I started skipping class all the time. I would stay in bed with my curtains drawn and I would just watch Gossip Girl back to back to back. That was like my escapism. The truancy officer even came to our house and my mum said she couldn't get me to go to school. I remember this lady came and sat on the end of my bed and she tried to ask me why I wasn't going to class Um, and I just pulled the covers up over my head and I, I refused to talk to her, which is crazy now I look back, but I was really not well. During this period, around 15, when I was really starting to struggle with my mental health, another one of those coincidences happened. One day, I went by myself to a second-hand shop, it was a Salvation Army, and I purchased two jumpers. As the lady was putting them in a bag, she looked at me and she said, I have something for you. She went out the back and I saw her tucking a pamphlet into the carrier bag for me. I said thank you, I walked out to my car, and I pulled out the pamphlet to see what she had given me, and I could not believe what I was reading. This is it. It says, Father's love letter, an intimate message from God to you, and it opens up to say, 
The words you are about to read are true. They will change your life if you let them, for they come from the heart of God. He loves you. He is the father you have been looking for all your life. He longs for you to come to him. This is his love letter to you. And it opens up again to this whole page of paraphrased Bible verses that have been put together like a letter. I'm just going to read a little bit of it to you. It says, my child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I am familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered, for you were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being, for you are my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake, for all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. You are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. I am your greatest encourager. I am also the father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are broken hearted, I am close to you. One day I will wipe away every tear from your eyes and I'll take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I have always been father and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? Love your dad, almighty God. I will show, if you're watching on the video, hopefully you can see that. As I read this, sitting in my car, I was blown away and I could not stop crying. It was an answer to every question I had. It spoke to every hurt in my heart. It was everything I had needed to hear. That I was not a mistake. That I was planned, that I was chosen, and that I had a dad. When I got home, I stuck it next to my bed, and I would read it any time that I was feeling down. And this wasn't the moment that I got saved, but I'd say it was the moment that I went from believing in God's existence to starting to get to know him personally. And seeing as there is one God who exists in three distinct persons, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I think of this as my introduction to God the Father, my first real personal connection with God was when I realized that he was my dad. Unfortunately, even after this incredible moment, my physical and mental health did continue to decline. I definitely needed the whole Trinity to get me back on track, and I still didn't know Jesus or the Holy Spirit yet. But my curiosity about God was growing. I became the person who actually wanted to open the door to Jehovah's Witnesses, I remember one time my mom going mad because I had been out somewhere and some Jehovah's Witnesses had stopped me on the street and I had given them my phone number, I gave them our address and mom was like, what are you doing? These people are going to be showing up at our house. But I wanted to hear from people. I wanted to hear about people's faith. I began listening to short sermons on YouTube and I began Googling questions about God I was really seeking truth, I just hadn't quite arrived at it yet. My eating disorder worsened to the point that we actually moved towns so I could be close to the hospital because I had so many appointments. I attempted to keep up with school through the hospital program, but eventually that became overwhelming. So at the age of 16, on the day I turned 16, I made the decision to legally sign myself out of school. Looking back, it's a bit sad because I think if everything hadn't happened, I probably would have stayed in school. I was quite a good student up until my mental health plummeted, but I was a shell of a person at this stage. I was in and out of home all the time, staying with my friend because I was arguing with my mom so much. She was just trying to help me 
she would cut toast into tiny little squares to try and get me to eat. I feel really bad for what I put my friends and family through during that time because I was on self-destruct mood. And there was nothing anyone could do to help because I didn't want to be helped. So they essentially had to watch me just destroying myself. Then at one point, I was living with my friend for a while, not really speaking to my mom, struggling in every area, and I made a decision that I was going to email my dad. My mom had given me his email address in the past, but I had always thought if he wants something to do with me, he would reach out, and why Why should I be the one to reach out to my dad? But I was tired of waiting to hear from him, and I wanted answers for myself, so I decided to send him an email, but I'm going to save all the details of that for a future episode because that is a whole story in and of itself. But at that time, I was so deep into this pit of depression that I didn't think I could get myself out. I also didn't see the point of getting myself out because although I don't believe I really wanted to die. I also didn't really want to live. I was at rock bottom. And I think the thing about rock bottom is that some people really have to reach that place before they'll call out to God. I had never truly sought God with desperation like I did when I was 17 when I had come to the end of myself and I needed to know, why am I here? Is there any point to all of this? And I had a friend who also wasn't in the best place at the time. She was going through something very similar to me, and I don't remember who suggested it to who, but we decided we were going to try going to church. She knew someone from her school who went to a church nearby. She asked if we could go with her, and one Sunday we went to a church service. Basically, from the moment we stepped into the building, I was crying. I cried through the whole worship set. I cried through the whole sermon. I am sure people must have been looking at me thinking, what is wrong with that girl? And at the time, I couldn't even tell you why I was crying. All I knew was that whatever I felt in that room was what had been missing my entire life. Everything changed for me from that moment. I felt peace for the first time. I felt real hope for the first time. I started to heal from my eating disorder. I continued going to church. I started to learn who Jesus is and what he did for me. And once I fully understood that, I made the decision to commit my life to him. You know how people say when you die, your whole life flashes before your eyes? Well, when I made that decision to truly follow Jesus, I was stood in church and I had my eyes closed. And it was like I could see my whole life like a movie up until that point. And all of a sudden, I could pinpoint every single moment that God had been trying to reach me. When I would do that walk home from school, listening to worship music. When someone would invite me to church when I was in high school and I didn't go. Songs I randomly heard about God, sermons I randomly found, the Father's love letter, the list goes on and on. But in an instant, it all became abundantly clear. God had tried to reach me in many specific and highly personal ways until I was ready to listen. And actually, one of my friends, who was not even a Christian, once said to me, imagine if things like that happen to everyone every day, but they choose not to see it. She wasn't even a believer, but she was on to something. Because the Bible talks about Jesus being a shepherd, and we are his flock, and he cares too much to leave even one of us that has wandered off. The Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. 
And no matter how far you've run or how long you've been running, he will not stop pursuing you. No matter what mistakes you have made or how much of a mess you may be in, I have had to accept as hard as it is and as much as I want vengeance and to hold on to unforgiveness, that even if my stepdad repented tomorrow and turned to Jesus, he would invite him in too. None of us are worthy of his love and his grace, but it was while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. That's how much he loves you. He is waiting to welcome you home. He is waiting to fill your heart with love and joy and peace. And when you finally open yourself up to experience it, you will realize this is what has been missing your whole life. Thank you so much for listening to my story today. I can't wait to share more in future episodes about how God has continued using all of this for good. Next week, I am sharing the story of what happened after I became a Christian because my mom was not on board with it at first. It's a story you do not want to miss, especially if you have unsaved family members. So I hope you will tune in again next week. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean so much to me if you would consider leaving a review and sharing it on social media. It has taken a long time to get this podcast going and now my prayer is just that it would go out to whoever needs to hear it. I'm so excited to continue sharing this 828 journey with you all. Until next time, God bless you guys. I will talk to you all again next week.